I spoke about the Industrial Revolution before, so often people's perception of the Industrial Revolution that is why they support Keynesianism today with the mixed economy or they support full-blown socialism. First of all, I would like to pay credence to that of the likes of the Mises Institute for the wealth of information that they've provided on this time period from great scholars like that of Thomas Ewish Jr., Robert P. Murphy, Thomas J. De Lorenzo, and even the late great of Ralph Reichel, who sadly passed away in December 2016, even from an historian like Robert Lefevere, Le I don't know if I've pronounced the name correctly, I will source those names in the description area below that you can check out for yourself. People view the Industrial Revolution as this terrible time period that the living conditions and working conditions were awful and had it not been for government being our saviour with its legislation, people would be still working endless hours for such little pay and there was a collapse of living standards etc etc. As Robert Lefevere had pointed out and even the likes of Ralph Reichel, when you view things from a still picture the problem with a still picture is, is the fact that there's no way to tell, to measure progress because a still picture in history does not tell you the information of what living conditions were like before that time period. It's a still image. It doesn't say anything. Yes, you could look at a still image and say how awful the living conditions were, but that's an irrational argument and what the big mistake that many historians made today was they looked at that still image, they looked at the living conditions and then they compared it to today's living conditions and wages. Robert Lefevere himself had made this argument that if you're going to measure progress to be able to judge whether people's living conditions had actually improved as well as their working conditions, you're going to have to look at what life was like before that time period. Ralph Reigel had mentioned about many of the things before. He mentioned about a French historian, Fernand Braudel, that wrote about a terrible winter in 1695 where the peasants were freezing and starving and dying in their hovels and that the King of France, King Louis XIV in the Palace of Versailles, had stared down in his wine glass that had frozen over. That puts everything into perspective. And then Ralph Reichel goes on to mention about in the late 18th century that a French revolutionary, in his own words, had mentioned happiness is a new idea in Europe, which gives you the contrasting difference between France of the late 17th century to the late 18th century, and as we know the Industrial Revolution kicked off in the mid 18th century. Even when you look at the period of the 1730s and there's, you know, the talk of, you know, Norway and Sweden that he mentions that they would mix tree bark with grain in order to make bread. This pretty much puts into perspective just how poor the people were before the Industrial Revolution. Another thing that Ralph Reichel goes on to mention is an English historian, Edward Gibbons, who wrote about that of the Roman Empire. He wrote his own autobiography in the 1730s and as Ralph Reichel mentions about Edward Gibbons, he wrote in his autobiography that the reason why he named several of his children Edward was because the fact that he fully expected that most of his children were going to die and that he wanted to try and keep his father's name in the family. And this was because life in that time period, before the Industrial Revolution, there was periodical famines. And this was because of the absence of secure private property rights, the absence of the enclosure movement. Because people would die because of the periodical famines. The average life expectancy of a child was the age of 9, and the average life expectancy of an adult was the age of 40. So that puts into perspective that life wasn't as simply glorious as these, you know, historians and whatnot try to paint it. If you were to contrast before the Industrial Revolution to after the First Industrial Revolution, the people actually had food on their tables. Robert Lefevere goes on to mention that before the Industrial Revolution, they suffered from common malnutrition diseases such as beriberi, scurvy and rickets. And of course, even Ralph Reichel mentions about the periodical famines before the Industrial Revolution. I've even mentioned about in North America during the starving time as a result of 
the communal ownership of property, the absence of secure private property rights, that there was starvation, and that as soon as people were giving their own private lot, that America thrived from that, and you never saw the famine since then. Well, it was no different with the enclosure movement. The enclosure movement put an end to that starvation. Through the factories, it allowed people to mass produce, it's why they had food on their tables. So, as Ralph Reichel mentions, before the Industrial Revolution, there was the periodical famines, the common malnutrition diseases such as what Robert Leifefer had mentioned, but most importantly, Ralph Reichel even goes on to mention about an English historian who was a critic of capitalism, E.P. Thompson, and E.P. Thompson is forced into a concession. It is quite possible for statistical averages and human experiences to run in opposite directions. You see that already he's trying to set up this, uh, so the, the grounds for some kind of concession. A per capita increase in quantitative factors may take place at the same time as a great qualitative disturbance in people's way of life. People may consume more goods and because, become less happy or less free at the same time. Okay, these are wonderful, very true, very true. What is he trying to do here? He's clearly trying to uh, uh, discount the concession that he's about to make. And keep in mind what great concession this is, because this is from the most severe critic. You understand all these things are debated. Uh, uh, what, what were the wages really? How much did people consume? Uh, indices are, uh, are examined and so on. So this is the most severe critic of the point of view of, uh, of improvement, and this is what he says. Over the period 1798, 1790 to 1840, notice he selects the, the year 1840, okay, not the year 1850, because that's gonna make a difference to his argument. There was a slight improvement in average material standards. We are a long way now from uh, J.L. and Barbara Hammond, who set the opinion of a, of a, of a whole generation and more, the British economic historians, who said the Industrial Revolution fell like a plague on the working class of England. Okay, we're a long way from that. We have the concession that there was, a, there was no collapse of living standards. There was, in fact, a slight improvement. Thompson says, by 1840, most people were, quote, better off, unquote. His quotes. I mean, I don't understand why you have to say, put that in quotes. I mean, they were better off, sure. Why don't you just say it? <clears throat> they were better off than, than their forerunners had been 50 years before, but they had suffered and continued to suffer this slight improvement as a catastrophic experience. Well, okay, debatable. That certainly is debatable. Uh, what he has conceded is what all along was the central part of the, of the debate, was the theme of the, con of the contention. And that, what he surrendered, is the question of living standards. That's him basically saying in a concession that the living conditions of industrial townhouses were much better off than what they came from living in 50 years before then in these awful hovels. Like I mentioned Ralph Reichel's example of what Fernand Brodel had wrote about in A Terrible Winter of 1695. The peasants were freezing and starving and dying in the hovels. They were simply awful. So this shows you that yes, the living conditions were improving and they were even, you know, improving to the point they would have food on their tables. Common sense would tell you that it's not because of government's legislation that would reduce the working hours, but thanks to that of the factories and the capital that would come along with it, such as that of the machinery, etc. Now, it's common sense that the machines could do a far quicker job and collect far more. A good example of this is contrasting in relation to the agrarian revolution, where through the agrarian-dominated economy, you had the people working endless hours on farms, more than 80 hours, working with their hands, whereas you contrast that to the big harvester machines that you see today, only one person doing the job in a big harvester, yet they're collecting far more grain on the field in quantity in a far shorter time period than that of a large group of people working endless hours collecting grain on a farm could, and even how you stored your food. You have to take all of that into account, because before that of the refrigerator, before all of these things, how did you preserve food? It took you 
far more hours in work to do so, more effort, and it would take up more of your time. Whereas thanks to the machines, it would free up such time and you're even able to multitask as I've mentioned before, such as having washing machines, dishwashers, and a variety of other different machines that would enable you to do other things. So for example, you could put your dishes in a dishwasher, you could even put your clothes in a washing machine, and whilst you're doing that, you can even go and iron your clothes. That's the very difference between the, the machines and what you had to do before all of that. So before the Industrial Revolution, it was only natural that you would be left in a state of working more than 80 hours per week, and, you know, if you ended up setting down government legislation in that manner, you would, you would have had ended up creating, you know, mass starvation. It was actually thanks to capitalism, through the, the capital created, such as that of the machines, that enabled people the luxury to free up their time to even go into new careers. There was time to even innovate new things such as the camera and along came photography and other arts and many other careers would open up as a result of that. So it's not because of government legislation that created that, it was thanks to capitalism. 